Welcome to World Inside with Tian Wei, coming to you from Beijing on CGTN. Coming up on today's program, U.S. Secretary of State Tillerson visits Beijing to discuss trade and the DPRK. Did America's top diplomat clear up all outstanding issues before Trump's state visit? And Yang Geling's novels have served as the inspiration for countless Chinese films. I speak to her about her works and her life. And we begin today's show in Beijing, where your Secretary of State Rex Tillerson paid his second visit to China in the year 2017. Tillerson's visit is said to pave the way for President Trump's visit to China later this year. The DPRK crisis and bilateral trade are also on the agenda. Chinese President Xi Jinping told U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson on Saturday that he expected President Donald Trump's upcoming visit to be wonderful as ties seem to warm up following tensions over how to handle the DPRK. I believe President Trump's upcoming visit to China is an important opportunity for furthering the China-U.S. relationship, and I hope the teams from both sides will make full preparations for this important event. I believe his visit will be a special, wonderful, and successful one. Trump's upcoming November visit will be the third meeting between the two leaders. They have spoken on the phone on several occasions and met at Mar-a-Lago in April and in Hamburg during the G20 summit in July. The U.S. president has touted his friendship with Xi, but also prodded the Chinese leader in recent months to exert more pressure on the DPRK to abandon its nuclear and missile activities. As Pyongyang's major trading partner, China has already banned textile trade and limited oil exports. With the new round of UN-backed sanctions in place, the relations between the world's greatest powers appear to be improving again. During his meeting with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, Tillerson said the preparations are important work. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Foreign Minister, and, and I appreciate you receiving my delegation so we can have a, a further exchange on a number of issues important to both of us, uh, but in particular to begin important work to prepare for the upcoming visit of President Trump. The China-U.S. relations currently maintain stable momentum while facing important junctures for further development. President Trump's visit is a big event in China-U.S. relations. The Chinese and U.S. heads of state attach great significance to it and have urged teams on both sides to communicate and coordinate closely. It is clear that China is optimistic about Trump's visit, and greater work between the two countries is likely to be crucial in resolving the DPRK nuclear issue. So what can the U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson's visit to Beijing do for the relations between China and the United States, and will it pave the way, as they say, for the trip and the state visit by President Trump to China later in the year. Let's loop in our guests to join us in Beijing. Victor Gao Zhikai, who is our current affairs commentator. Welcome, sir. Thank in you. Washington, D.C., in the U.S., we invited Robert Daly, director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States at the Wilson Center. Mr. Daly, welcome as well. Thank you. This is a very different administration. The style of governance certainly is different to use an adjective the list. Uh, Mr. Daly, how much do you think this visit by Secretary Tillerson is really likely to set the tone for President Trump's visit? It's very difficult to say, not because Secretary Tillerson is not an able diplomat, but because there are so many factors in play. The tone is likely to be set uh, by what's happening in the Korean Peninsula on the eve of the visit. We think that, you know, the issues will be the North Korean nuclear question, trade and investment relations between the United States and China. That could also change. So we have many, many variables in play. And so Tillerson's visit is important. He can help set the agenda, but he cannot change the news cycle between now and when President Trump arrives. Mm. Two layers. One is the variables. Uh, Mr. Daly had talked about. Secondly, President Trump of course, is well known for doing so-called deal diplomacy in a way. So will these two layers help Chinese to prepare for that trip? Well, I think uh, Secretary of State Tillerson's visit is very important for two purposes. One is indeed to lay the foundation for the state visit by President 
Donald Trump to China later this year. But secondly, I think equally important is to have a very thorough discussions with the Chinese counterparts to share views and exchange ideas mm. about what China and the United States need to do together to deal with several major crises, especially on the Korean Peninsula. So I would say the second part of Secretary Tillerson's visit is in itself a very important mission. But you know, Dr. Gao, things are changing around the clock. Every hour we speak, if we're talking about the latest development on the Korean Peninsula, probably there's something you can quote afresh on air. So will plan now really help to serve the solution later? Dr. Gao. Well, definitely. I think uh, for the escalating crisis on the Korean Peninsula involving DPRK's nuclear weapon program, uh, we need to leave no stone unturned in our effort to do all the preparation against all kinds of possibilities, both peaceful means as well as uh, other contingency plans. And I think to achieve denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula now mm. has become such an important priority for all the countries involved yeah. and for the international community but, but, itself. But there, at the same time, you know, uh, Mr. Daly, there's also the danger that the DPRK issue is going to overpower all the other important issues between China and the United States, as if that is the only thing between the two countries. But as we all know, the ultimate purpose of these two countries go far beyond the, just the DPRK. So how are we going to balance that? That's so crucial, isn't it, Mr. Daly? I, I, I think it is. There, one of the things that Secretary Tillerson can do is speak with his Chinese counterparts specifically about what a path to diplomacy and discussion might look like. China has been calling for diplomacy right along. Secretary Tillerson has been the most active in the Trump administration of trying to find a way to get to a discussion or negotiating table. But neither Secretary Tillerson nor the Chinese side has been specific about how you might get there. Mm -hmm. And then, as you say, other clocks are ticking. The U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer has announced uh, that he will conclude the 301 investigation into Chinese trade and investment practices before Donald Trump goes to Beijing. Mm. So that is another shoe that is waiting to drop. What will be the result of those investigations and what will be the state of play on trade and investment? That's also very difficult to predict at this stage. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gao, I understand in this part of the world, China particularly, I think there is some kinds of intense pressure the United States is trying to put on China before President Trump's visit to China because they understand China wants to create a great atmosphere for that state visit because China understands the importance of this bilateral relations. The question is, how is China not going to be taken advantage by this clock that the U.S. set, but on the other hand, try to promote the bilateral relationship on the longer term? Now, I don't think the United States is uh going to gain anything if it really wants to launch a trade war against China. Both China and the United States will be losers if a trade war does break out. And further, I would say, while the crisis on the Korean Peninsula is not the totality of the relations between China and the United States, the United States need to send the right signal to DPRK, to South Korea, to China, for example, uh, so that we will all be on the same page in dealing with this escalating crisis. The United States will not serve its own fundamental interest mm. if it wants to alienate China on other important matters while keeps wanting to have all the Chinese support on the DPRK situation. I the see. United States need to be consistent and need to come up with a well coordinated the policy and strategy in dealing with the unfolding crisis on the Korean, si Korean Peninsula. Yeah, Mr. Daly, do you think Washington really understands this with the, the administration besides pressure, what else they have in the hand, whether it's about DPRK issue or having this long-term relationship with China? Well, I think it's really a, a question for both governments of what does this uh, long-term historic process of acclimating to each other look like. So if we look at the question of, of trade and investment, we don't need to leap right from talk of friction to a trade war. There can be all kinds of adjustments and moves that fall short of a trade war. And I think the problem is when we leap to saying, well, a trade war is, is against all of our interests. Of course it is, but there is a lot that can be done mm. to make the terms, especially of investment, far more equitable. And this is what we're hearing in the United States is more calls for 
reciprocity mm. and more calls to for uh, the what's called the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. to take a more skeptical look at Chinese investments in the United States from the point of view of national security. That's not a trade war. That, from the United States' point of view, is a long overdue correction to get fair terms of trade. Mm. And so I don't think we should leap to that sort of more inflammatory rhetoric. Not all frictions are trade wars. All right. I mean, Dr. Gao, of course, uh, there are different understandings from both sides about certain common issues. And Mr. Daly just argued, uh, articulated the U.S. side of the interpretation. What about the Chinese side of interpretation? No, I would say the more investments there will be between China and the United States, either by American companies into China or the Chinese companies into the United States, it will be better for both China and the United States. And I think the United States will help themselves better and create more meaningful jobs if there will be larger amount of Chinese investments into the United States, especially in the infrastructure sector. And therefore, the American friends should not be afraid of investments coming out of China into the United States. Mm. I think the United States can benefit from the Chinese investments into the United States, like so many other countries around the world are benefiting as we speak right. from the Chinese investments. Further, I would say, uh, in terms of dealing with the trading balance between China and the United States, China has big market for many other products from the United States, yeah. and it's up to the United States to come up with more goods and services to sell to the Chinese consumers. We need to adopt a more dynamic view about how to further increase the size of China-US trade rather than get onto each other's throat as if you know, the trading balance as it is, is more, the only bad result between more China and dynamic. the United States. That's exactly the word here. However, we have seen the trends of protectionism from uh, different countries at this point. So how are you, for example, gentlemen, you both advocated about great trade, and that's going to be crucial for our countries. Be able to articulate that within your own countries, because we understand at this point, both countries have some structural problems to deal with. It has to be done, and better sooner than later. And many of the pressures coming from both sides from, toward one another actually have a lot to do with the structural problem itself. So, are we going to have plans to solve these structural problems, or are we going to keep our fingers pointing at one another and say, it is your problem? Please fix it. And Mr. Daly, let's go to you first. Well, I, I think we've already seen some movement in the United States over the past year in that it's now fairly broadly understood that, for example, uh, Chinese currency manipulation, which candidate Trump talked about a lot during the elections, is really not an issue anymore. And furthermore, it's now broadly understood that the trade deficit per se is not the biggest problem. Mm. The focus in the United States has shifted to fair terms of investment and reciprocity. And I think that on this uh, front, the United States and China have pretty similar ideas of what constitutes fairness and reciprocity. So right. I think that there is some room there uh, for optimism. Mm. Dr. Gao? I think uh, for the American friends, they should not have the cake and try to eat it at the same time, or sometimes do not have the cake and try to eat the cake at the same time. I think the United States has great potential to first boost its export to China. And we are talking, right. for example, about the possibility of LNG export from the United States into the Chinese market. And that in itself can go a long mile in uh, contributing to more balance in China-US trade. So I would say let's be dynamic, let's be interactive, okay. let's come up with more goods that the Americans can sell to China so that eventually we'll have more and better and more balanced the trade and also and we greater don't. reciprocity. We don't want to forget that this is a Rex Tillerson, the State Secretary's visit to China. So after all, what kind of message will Secretary Tillerson be able to carry back home? And will those messages, uh, Mr. Daly, be able to be beautifully articulated to the White House? And will the White House look at that as the priority preparing for the final state visit? I think that is also a crucial question, given mm. the lack of understanding of structures of command right now in the United States from outside. So Secretary Tillerson will undoubtedly bring back very positive messages about how the Chinese side is looking forward to President Trump's historic visit and they want to work with him. There will be a lot of positive, very, very general 
language. And President Trump, in my view, is going to be extremely well received in China. They are going to give him a thicker, wider, longer red carpet <laughs> than they've given any president, uh, frankly, in an attempt to flatter him because they think that he can be flattered and manipulated. And that may very well work. We're going to have to wait and see. It may work in the short term. Whether it will solve the deep structural and strategic problems, I'm more doubtful about that. Mm -hmm. But you can be sure that Beijing and Washington will both declare great success at the conclusion of President Trump's visit. Mm. Uh, Dr. Gao, I mean, this is going to be likely after China's uh, 19th Party Congress, which is a big thing for China. And after that, China is going to streamline once again its priorities, look at its relationship with the outside world. United States is a crucial part of it. And how do you think this is likely? this trip by Rex Tillerson articulated in China and during China's preparation, not just for that red carpet, but for the real discussion with President Trump. I think in China, both the leadership in the government as well as the Chinese people at large uh, look forward to the upcoming state visit by President Donald Trump. And also, I think um, Secretary of State Tillerson's visit is a very important uh, preparation for the state visit. I hope the Chinese people will come up with strong recommitment to greater friendship between China and the United States. And Secretary of State Tillerson will go back to Washington, D.C., and uh, brief President Donald Trump that China is not an enemy of the United uh -huh. States, and China is a friend of the United States, and China and the United States can really Really build up greater partnership for greater achievements okay. for greater stability in the world <laughs> and if China and the United States cannot really engage with each other mm -hmm. in a constructive manner the world will be much worse I'm sure than many it is of now. those languages will appear in the common uh, statement or communique uh, later in the visit or before that but one of the things is we see this trend state visit people to people this is gonna pave the way but at times, it only lasts for half a year or only a few months before another big issue pop up and totally change the tone of the bilateral relationship. But Mr. Daly, how hopeful should we be about President Trump to China and fundamentally be able to help us with this bilateral ties in the relatively longer term, Mr. Daly? I think that we are in for a long period of very difficult adjustment uh, increased distrust and perhaps increased friction across a range of fronts in U.S.-China relations. Uh, and this, this gets to structural issues that Dr. Gao and I have discussed in earlier programs. Uh, simply making you know, positive statements about friendship is not going to be sufficient when there are deep structural real reasons mm. for strategic distrust between the two nations. I think that it's within our capacity to manage these increased frictions such that they don't break out into conflict. I, I, I'm not terribly pessimistic about that, but I don't see very many true bright spots in the mm. official relationship between the United States and China in the near future. All right, Dr. Gao, there's going to be the test of DPRK, whether China and the United States be able to be on the same boat when it comes to vision, how to solve it. There's also likely to be some trade issues before President Trump's visit to China. So can the two countries really figure out the real common ground, Dr. Gao. I'm actually more optimistic than uh, Mr. Daly about the future direction of China-U.S. relations. Okay. Why? Because we cannot afford to be pessimistic. We cannot be afford to be down uh, crested about the future development of China-U.S. relations. Mm -hmm. Dr. Henry Kissinger uh, gave the right assessment when he said war is not an option between China and the United States. And by default or by our uh, volition, we need to be more constructive to promote a better partnership between China and the United States. That's the only viable option between Washington and Beijing. Option one, and that's the only option. For now, I want to thank the both of you because both of you have been working hard for this bilateral relations, whether you are an ultimate optimist or relative optimist for now. <laughs> Robert Daly, Victor Gao Jikai, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. And you're watching World Inside with Tian Wei, still to come on our program. Yan Ge Ling's novels have served as inspiration for countless Chinese films. I speak to her about her works and her cooperation with some of the biggest names of Chinese all over the world.
Take two chefs, add 5,000 miles, and mix in two very different cultures. This is a story of unlikely companions united through the language of food on a journey of discovery and reinvention. Express. See the world in color. This is CGTN. You're watching CGTN. I'm Jeff Moody, live in Beijing. You're watching CGTN. Coming to you from Washington, D.C. You're watching CGTN. Coming to you from my room. Guys, I'm members of the Mark, what more can you tell us about events happening there? The politics this is a pretty picture. I need to see a fan. Back over to Beijing. To go after me. CGTA. See the difference. We have come a long way. Changes happen and fast from all corners, different lives, voices, and visions. Encouraged to think, enlightened to change. World Insight with Tian Wei go beyond the headlines. Welcome back. You're watching World Inside with Tian Wei, coming to you Monday to Friday on CGTN. Novels always provide great material for movies. Yan Geling is one of the writers, originally from China, who provided bountiful inspiration to the Chinese film industry. Born in Shanghai in the late 1950s, Yan experienced the huge changes within her home country and the perils of conflict as a war correspondent. These inspire her to start a writing career all over the world. There are many books she wrote about her China life and her understanding of her home country, including Youth, one of the latest work, which reads like a biographic novel and was adapted into a Chinese film. Before the film's release, I spoke to Yan and learned about her insights. <music> Uh, youth is uh, such uh, um, uh, abundant life. You can afford to make uh, uh, wrong moves. You can afford to waste uh, your love, your emotions, and it, uh, it's uh, you can afford to be stupid. You know, just so, embrace everything. Right, right. You try everything. If it's a mistake, well, sorry. You know, that uh, I still have time to make up. Right, so uh, that's uh, you. You learn, you know. You learn by making mistakes. Mm -hmm. So it's all allowed, and the people will forgive you, and you forgive yourself too. But nowadays, if I make a mistake, I might never forgive myself. You are trying in this novel 
speaking with different voices as an author, hmm. but at the same time as a young dancer. So how would you be able to jump back and forth between the used to be you and the current you? Was it painful? Um, was it fun? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, the, the author in the novel actually is also a, a, a fictitious uh, person uh, because I can tell uh, truth better uh, hiding behind my characters. I have more courage because then I don't have this self-censorship. You know, so if, what if uh, people hold me responsible for what I said, you know, as a Geling or mm -hmm. as Yan Geling who said such and such, then they will probably, I'll have to be responsible for all these uh, remarks. Mm -hmm. But uh, as an author who could be me or could be somebody else, you know, people can't really tell, mm -hmm. then I'll be much more courageous and much more uh, truthful. What was the writing process like for you? Is it about yourself or is it about your readers? Oh, it's always about myself. <laughs> <laughs> as frank as that, I love you, Gerling. <laughs> yes, I, uh, I think uh, Gerling as a reader is very hard to please. Mm -hmm. And so I think and uh, it, every book I wrote, uh, uh, I only have one audience, which is uh, myself and it, it was used to be my father you know because my uh, uh, before he passed away he was my first reader and he was also my editor you know he his uh, Chinese foundation is much better so he would uh, you know misspell the words and he would uh, correct them yeah do you miss him of course dearly oh my god very badly very badly because he used to live here uh, uh, we used to live in um, my husband uh, as U U U.S. diplomat uh, uh, you, uh, was uh, stationed in Africa. Uh, my father asked me to bring back African art. I did as much as he could because the weight was uh, so, uh, you know, so much. You tried your best. Yes. And I'm sure he enjoyed every minute of it. Yes. Yes, he used to just talk to, and, uh, to them like, ah, oh, yeah, it's, uh, well, I knew uh, if there were no Africa, the African art, there would be no Picasso. And he, he was just like, uh, you know, murmuring to these. Uh, and, uh, he was. Uh, yes. How the world is like, I guess. Yes. He's amazed. Yes. Always. Yeah. And we you have that too. Yes. You have that too. That kind of curiosity, that kind of passion. Yes. Um, and a, a tremendous mental a, uh, energy, you know, could uh, one could tell, <laughs> <laughs> one could tell. <laughs> but you know what? I guess it's a very delicate balance that you, whether as a woman, as an individual, as a writer, to be cool-headed about what you've seen, what is going on, while at the same time still being passionate about life. Um, I have the ability to step aside or step behind, you know. I'm also very uh, uh, observant and uh, perceptive. But any good writer has to be cool-headed. Uh, you know, you have to have uh, uh, enough uh, rationality, uh, be, uh, which is to control uh, your passion mm -hmm. and uh, everything, because uh, to write a novel is not like uh, just a paint uh, abstract painting. Not a painting. love letter to the officer. <laughs> no. Yeah, you have to uh, to use uh, all your skills and your uh, best language, so which uh, uh, takes a lot of thinking. Yeah. And uh, every novel has to have a meaning or m meanings, layers of meanings. So if you don't have that uh, rationality, that uh, 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 cool as, uh, uh, as cool as uh, a thinker, mm -hmm. so you can't uh, uh, put those meanings in there. Mm. But you know, China is changing so fast, so any writer that can really dig themselves a hole and create something, be able to be cool-minded is amazing. Um, I always remind myself uh, that I'm only a, a worker, you know, just a normal worker, ordinary. You have to go to your office every day. You know, don't be so 
uh, egocentric about your job. You know, it's just that you know if you spend more time there and you think more, you can write better. Mm -hmm. So this is just like any craftsman. Uh, you 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 spend all your concentration and your imagination, and uh, you can you can work better pieces out. But you know, you've been through different kinds of cultural changes. Uh, here in China, then you go to the United States. What is this change been like for you? I mean, did you enjoy at the very beginning? Now, do you enjoy the same degree as you used to be? Oh, I think I'm just a born uh, a gypsy, you know, because <laughs> uh, since 12, uh, I've been uh, touring. touring from one, but, you know, it's also one Always way drifting. station and, uh, after another, you know, every day we, we travel, then uh, after we arrive, we give performance, and next day we pack and uh, travel, get on the, uh, on the truck again, and, you know, Tibet is so big, and there are so many, uh, a century posts and uh, and uh, way stations and uh, small uh, regiments. Um, so it, it's to me it's very normal, uh, very normal for me to be in a culture I don't understand. Mm -hmm. And so I I think then I I feel like uh, you know it's it makes me high you know and uh, it's t something I can learn mm -hmm. and something. Um, I can't take for granted, you know. I I don't like a life that I can take everything for granted. It, it, it uh, it's not my life. You I need like to be to, challenged. Yes, yes. I I, I want to uh, see something new. Uh, in Europe, uh, can uh, can satisfy my the the, the desire of uh, being a gypsy mm -hmm. and traveling all the time because uh, you know one hour. Uh, of a uh, flight, uh, you can be, an, uh, you can land in a different culture, That's different right. uh, language, different uh, cuisine. You know, so it's uh, you know only see the their pillows. You know, German they have square pillows, and uh, French they have narrow pillows. <laughs> you know, you know, just it's just even so just details like that. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, huh? yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But those are very different from the novels that you're writing. So how are your exposure to all of these different cultures help you eventually to be able to get closer to what you exactly want to write, which is usually your own life, very Chinese life, I guess? I, uh, uh, you know, uh, normally I write the story which happened before 1990, right? So that that, that uh, I'm a very uh, familiar with. Yes, yes. And uh, I can tell stories with, with authority and authenticity. But write about uh, the uh, contemporary China. I always have to uh, to do a lot of research. For example, the the the, the dancing man. You no, know, I uh, I published last year was about, about young dancing men working in the dancing hall, a very old Shanghai dancing hall, to uh, dance with uh, rich and much older ladies. Mm -hmm. So this kind of, it's totally opposite to, to the phenomenon before in Shanghai, which was a rich, big guy dancing with young uh, dancing girls. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought that, that this is a, so it, such an interesting you know, change. And now women have money and power, and they're single, they could uh, do uh, the same thing as uh, the big rich guy uh, in 30s, 1930s. So I, um, I had to dance in there, right? <laughs> I had to get a, a coach, a dancing coach. Mm -hmm. So in, to, in order to understand and to observe all the dancers, uh, you know, all the, all the people entertaining themselves there. So I, every time I go to Shanghai, I would uh, go to the same dance dancing uh, dance hall and uh, to to get this uh, coach to teach me and so I became one of the characters in my novel and it was very expensive uh, uh, lessons <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, and, and what did you learn what did you learn um I learned how you know you have to buy them drinks so you have to buy them dinner so you have to <laughs> pay tips <laughs> <laughs> it's not an easy life. No, yeah. no. So you don't want to change uh, 
to the men's position. Do yeah. you? <laughs> After all of this, <laughs> too complicated. Yeah, then you you see, you you realize uh, how far the women have uh, changed. You know how far they have gone from uh, you know those uh, uh, young dancing girls who, who, whose lives are totally controlled by the you know the, the big heads of uh, the society. Have we have we really changed that much? The Chinese women. Some of. Yeah, some of us. So there was many uh, uh, single and uh, uh, powerful ladies nowadays. Are we as strong inner <laughs> as we used to uh, be? So, uh, yeah, I think we're stronger, uh, stronger um, uh, because of uh, the opportunities uh, of uh, getting education and the opportunities of working. But you know, the thing is, where are our role models? That is probably one of the most important thing for women. What do you make of this changes that women today's China are facing from let's get liberated mm -hmm. to now you are half of this guy and now real liberated because you have all options in your own hands, mm -hmm. apparently. Collective uh, subconsciousness is very hard to change. I used to say, you know, I, uh, I like men give me gifts, but I like better, I have the right to buy my own gift. Uh, when I uh, was in the US, um, my husband uh, uh, sent me on a house hunting. A trip. So he said, uh, uh, "The house, if you like, and then, then I'll love to live it in too." Because uh, you know, women make the home, right? Then I put a checkbook in my uh, pocket. <laughs> then I went. Then I saw this house I really like. Uh -huh. Then I put deposit. Five thousand for the deposit, okay. uh, and so that kind of power. Fortunately, I it's not five hundred thousand. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the power you feel. Yeah, economic power is very important. Important, yes. For self-respect. Yeah, but confidence. for you, just as you before you you asked me if uh, it's changing for better, but I think you know Chinese life is too governed by money, um, and uh, I think there is uh, something missing or the spiritual life. I'm anxious for Chinese people and anxious to see how they go uh, further, you know, without uh, the, that, uh, the, the mind. Uh, the, um, progress. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah, progress. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it always feel like uh, mm, there is more you want. There is more material you want. It, nobody realized that this is uh, always a limit to uh, your material desire. Um, so, so that's that's something I I want to uh, to be. Uh, um, um, I don't know. Maybe I write novels, write better novels, and more people read my novels, and go to uh, film uh, theaters more, and can uh, help a little bit. You have written scripts for almost every one of those big names in Chinese contemporary movie theaters these days. But these are the circumstances that you cannot control. And sometimes your story has to be changed. This is a very commercial society, which is very different from the basic quality you have as an individual. You're a romantic person to begin with, something you want to protect yourself from the, all the other surroundings. So all of these cannot be controlled. How does that work for you? Oh, well, I just uh, uh, try to do my job, you know, uh, and I always uh, 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 warn myself, okay, to, to make a movie. It's a mainly director's uh, uh, creation, you know. You have to help him reach the, the best phase of his creation. It's not about uh, how you write, uh, what you write, because the, in the end, in the, it's going to be uh, the, you know, every department of the filmmaking that work. Mm. You know, every director, if five directors uh, f uh, uh, read my novels, uh, they all think uh, this is a good uh, material for adaptation into a movie, and they see 
five different pictures that's from right. that different novel. versions. Yes, a uh, work was a Zhang Chen, was a Chen Kai Ge, was yeah. a Zhang Yimou, and uh, it's very interesting that uh, once a uh, Chen Kai Ge and Chen, Zhong Chen are both interested in my uh, novella called The White Snake. Right. And, uh, you know, then Joan told me the, you know, what I'm going to make that movie into. And uh, from uh, uh, the Kai Ge's uh, script, uh, he, because he already had somebody yeah. um, adopted into a, a movie script, I said it's totally, totally different, different stories. Yeah, stories. So I understand, you know, you, if this director take this material, you have to let him do his own work. But you did observe from your perspective how some of the most well-known cultural figures in China work mm -hmm. and how do they interact, how is the public interacting with them, mm -hmm. and how they are reflecting upon their days and their work and what kind of future they are looking for in their own works because they need to talk to you. Yes, yeah. Um, for, for, for example, this time uh, when I worked with uh, Feng Xiaogang, uh, this time the experience is uh, very smooth, mm -hmm. very happy. You know, uh, it's uh, nothing he was uh, deadly against. So I put everything I thought you should be in the script from the novel, and uh, he liked them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he, he uh, only that he said, this is too long, this is way too long, this is script, <laughs> you know, you ha have to cut one third. Mm -hmm. So then I was doing cutting and on a script. Geling, such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank All you the best. For the and opportunity. Yeah. You are still living in youth. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. And that was Yang Geling, one of China's most well known contemporary writers, talking about her works and her life. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Inside CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Cineweibo. From me, Tianwei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. Good night.